Okay, call to order the Planning, Transportation, and Protective Services Committee. Um, can I have a motion to approve the agenda? So moved. moved by Director Hill, seconded by Director Cullington. Discussion? Those in favor? Opposed? Carried. Move on to Chair's remarks. Uh, we have uh, today the presentation, the much anticipated presentation of the results from the Citizens Advisory Group for the uh, Dear committee, um, we have uh, the chair and vice chair, Jocelyn Skirlak and Bob Moody sitting here, and um, we have four members of the committee sitting at the uh, lower end on, the, on this side. Um, I don't know their names. I, I'm just wondering if you could introduce them to us. Thank you. Sorry about that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, uh, be before you get into the presentation, I just just yeah. for now, if you could just introduce the uh, the four S members that are certainly. Yes, okay. thank you. Um, starting from the end on the right, uh, Patrick O'Rourke. Next to Patrick, Glenn Jim. Next to Glenn, Terry Mitchell, and beside Terry, Lisa Cadon. Con uh, Kadonaga, sorry, Lisa. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Okay. And we'll get to the presentation in a minute. I, um, for those of you that don't come to these regular meetings, uh, Director Hill here usually starts off his committee meetings with a very uh, sophisticated uh, presentation on his remarks, and I thought, well, okay, I'm gonna try and do what he did, so I wrote something up that was really good, and then I locked it in my car, which is sitting down at the GVLRA. So, so, <laughs> so I'm just going to have to go what I usually do, which is sort of a, an ad, ad lib thing here. First of all, I'd really like to thank the committee members. Um, when we started this out, we were kind of dubious as to where it was going to go and whether we should even undertake it. Uh, I know you people have gone through a lot of work, a lot of publicity, and uh, personally, I am really very pleased with the results and uh, very appreciative with what you've come up with. As far as the committee goes, um, it's our responsibility. We have a number of responsibilities in the committee. One of them is, is to ensure that anything that goes before the board will actually work, that it's viable and not speculative. And I ask the committee, that's something that we're going to have to really consider today. The uh, recommendations that you've made are um, a lot of them are dependent on the province. The province is going to have to provide support and it's going to have to be prepared to change some of their regulations. It's also going to depend a lot on individual municipalities and may have to change some of their bylaws. These are uh, contained, getting to that point, and that's incumbent on this committee to do that. Um, which, how can this committee advance these recommendations in a way that will have the best chance of success uh, these are questions that we're going to have to ask and deal with at this, at this committee level. The recommendation that's before you is to refer this back to staff uh, where they will um, have, uh, they will undertake meetings with the province and, uh, and put the pressure there. It really is, has to start with the province. We have sent letters initially. The province said that we had to undertake this process. We did, and I think quite successfully. So now the next step, uh, it, the rec recommended step, is to refer this to the staff to, um, to ensure that the province will undertake these measures and step up to the plate in essence. Um, just in case there was any questions as to what the actual recommendation entailed. They, we'll get into that discussion as we, uh, after we have heard from the Deer Committee. I think one of the main questions that we also have to ask at this committee level is what role should the CRD actually undertake? Um, and that uh, will probably again depend on, on, on what we get back from the province in, in terms of what they're willing to undertake. The one thing that I would like to see happen, and that is that we advance this with uh, 
um, sufficient speed that we can have something in place for the uh, beginning of the growing season next year, at least for the agricultural areas. Um, one thing that I think was very prominent in the report was that there is no one-size-fits-all solution, that uh, certain areas have vastly different uh, problems and solutions. Uh, so if uh, something I'm going to ask the committee to consider is, again, maybe prioritizing certain things, and um, probably the agricultural portion is the one that should get the first attention. Anyway, those are just uh, some observations that I've had on this, and um, I'll uh, now turn this over to the, uh, the chair and the vice chair to uh, present the recommendations to the board. Go ahead. Good. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, committee members, ladies and gentlemen, hello, I'm Jocelyn Skurlak, and I'm the chair, and beside me is Bob Moody, who is the vice chair of the Citizens Ad, uh, Advisory Committee. I just want to preface, uh, before I get right into the presentation, uh, two things I'd like to address. And one is that uh, the, the way this uh, committee was selected, uh, it, it really correlates with the advice given in a book called The Wisdom of Crowds by James Surowiecki. And he said that by, if you have important decisions affecting large numbers of people, you should consider getting people of diverse opinions from diverse views, uh, diverse backgrounds. And from that, you will get an aggregation of how people feel. They'll give a truer, they'll study more, they'll give better shades of gray. And because they uh, are all from different areas, they will also rule with their head, not their heart, when they come to these decisions. And this has been very important in this process, that we have not been swayed um, particularly by just mainly focused on emotional things, because it is a very emotional um, matter. Uh, if you do that, you're being ruled by your heart, not your head. And as they say, love is blind, and you tend to overlook a lot of options. So. There is wisdom in crowds, and I think CAG has been, the Citizens Advisory Committee has been, a group has been a really good example of the wisdom that does come out of crowds. Um, the other thing is that uh, I'd like to mention that when we started this process, we had 11 members. Three of them left along the way, fairly early in the process. People leave committees. I'm sure all of you have been on many, many committees, and you can identify that when you get committees, particularly ones with a, a um, nature such as this, with an emotional content, controversial content such as this, that some people are going to come to the committee expecting certain outcomes. And maybe they can't, they don't find those outcomes, they don't find, uh, they may even just find they don't have the time to come, they may find they have health reasons. People leave committees for all kinds of reasons. And I just want to make that point. Some leave with a, a whimper, some leave with a, a clamor, and some just quietly fade away. And uh, so we did end up as a very cohesive group. We studied many, many aspects of the, uh, all the fabrics that made up our final decision. Okay, a few, uh, I'll just get us going here on this. Do I have? Okay. Thanks. Thanks, Jeff. Okay, so here's the chronology of the Citizens Adversary Group, Advisory Group. Um, we started off in April and uh, people, the board appoints the citizens advisory group. May was data collecting, background collecting. June, information uh, evaluation and analysis. And we all in our, our group, which I will keep referring to as the CAG, so I hope you understand what I'm referring to here. Um, in the CAG, we did an awful lot of reading during June. Uh, it didn't slow down really, but June was really buried us uh, in information, but we uh, appreciated that. 
Uh, and then in July, we, we started to go through the management options and make our evaluation. Finally, August, we came down to the recommendations. So the first thing we had to look at were the management options. The management options were things that came out of the urban ungulate um, analysis that was given out to the municipalities earlier. And uh, it, it looked at the things that needed to be addressed by the citizens' advisory group. So some of these things, uh, the hazing, uh, if there were four areas, sorry, five areas. Conflict reduction uh, around uh, the regional deer management strategy, deer vehicle collisions, population reduction, fertility control, and public education and outreach. And within each of those five areas, you can see there are other things mentioned. So we went through each of these and evaluated the effectiveness and the various aspects of them, which I'll come to in a moment. Hazing and frightening for anybody who's uh, wondering what it is, it was using things like dogs, it was using things like sonar noises, uh, a, a sonar uh, deterrence, uh, visual deterrence, all the kind of things that might frighten deer and make them go elsewhere. Landscaping alternatives referred mainly to uh, changing the way we make our gardens, what we plant, how we can deter deer from finding a buffet nearby. Fencing, we looked at the different kinds of fencing and, and uh, not just uh, the kinds of different kinds of fencing, but also the heights, requirements, etc. Repellents looked at uh, mostly the ones that are available, such as Bobex, which people are, have been using quite uh, uh, readily in particularly Oak Bay, it seems. Um, cap uh, and then the population reduction. Capture and relocation, uh, moving deer to a, another spot. Uh, capture and euthanase, Movi not moving deer, sorry, um, killing deer, capturing and killing deer. Control public hunting, uh, and I think most of these are pretty much speak to themselves. That would mean hunting that is just not everybody comes out, guns are blazing. You have controlled people hunting in controlled areas during specific times. Professional sharpshooting, where people are hired specifically to come. They may need to be registered. Uh, it's not open to the public. And crop protection, which took in how we can help farmers to uh, keep, keep uh, producing our local food source. Deer uh, vehicle collision was simply looking at all the different ways we can try and mitigate all the accidents around deer for the deer's sake and for our own sakes and a lot of our um, source of information was uh, ICBC. Fertility control was looking at immunocontraception, the use of SPAVAC and what's available out there that and how it works uh, in trying to actually uh, control the number of deer that are produced yearly. And finally, public education. Uh, and outreach, teaching people how, what we can do to mitigate wildlife. If we're going to live with wildlife, what can we do so that there is less conflict and uh, less uh, accidents and just helping people to understand from what deer are, what wild animals in our environment means. It's, it's a bit of a two-way thing. So the next thing is uh, the criteria that we use to evaluate, evaluate each of those uh, management options. The first one, we looked at the effectiveness of each of these things and considered just how well does this option that we were looking at, for example, fencing, how, how well does it address the broader issue of high deer population density? Uh, 
Um, how does it address sustained reduction in deer-human conflict? How does it um, over work? How effective is it over the short and the long term? And is it an easy thing to uh, take care of, to monitor? Feasibility referred to more to the physicality of um, the, the achieving the, the uh, management option. So it looked at things like, what kind of personnel do you need to make this happen? What kind of technology, equipment, the tools required? And um, to consider how they all work together. Capability was, we looked at more of the legal aspects of making this happen. The uh, legal administration required, are there laws that prevent it? Are there laws that could be put into place or bylaws, regulations, et cetera? Are there limitations to them? How can we go about removing those limitations or should they be stay, remain in place? The next thing was cost and economic impact. And cost refers to the implementation of the how, what actually it costs, for example, to put a fence up. Um, and how easy is it to maintain? So it was an in initial and ongoing cost, if any, related to what we were looking at. And then um, also the economic uh, impact. Uh, is there a, a need to create a better situation of long term to continue with this thing, this option? Uh, time, the next one, consider the time required to implement each option. For example, is it a one-time thing? Is it something that you can just get on and do right away? Is it something that maybe uh, is going to take delays because of bylaws that have to be looked at or jurisdictional authorities of some kind, uh, permissions that need to be gained and changed? Uh, is, it a and is it a short or long-term requirement? For example, is, if it's fencing, it's, it's quick to put it up, but how much time to keep it going and keep it uh, being effective? It's going to need repairs or it may need replacing. Support and enthusiasm. Um, this was a little trickier because you have to well, they're all tricky, by the way. <laughs> uh, but this was tricky because we had to consider the degree of support that each of the management options may have by the general public in terms of addressing the, co the conflict. Um, we had to consider the degree of support that each option may have by not just the public, but by policymakers in terms of addressing the conflict. And we also had to consider the acceptability of each option from the perspective of its huma humaneness. Uh, so in other words, uh, it may be effective and do the job, but there's going to be some or maybe many who won't uh, really like it. For example, hunting. Um, and finally, negative human, uh, sorry, negative community impacts. Uh, how does it affect our health? Uh, how, how does it address, are there health issues around having lots of deer? Uh, one of the concerns is l Lyme disease. Is there other health issues around using repellents that might affect our food sources, spraying our crops, our food crops? Um, and, uh, then finally, consider the opportunities for First Nations involvement in the implementation of, of each option, as in, for example, hunting, which does have restrictions, and the processing of the food, of the meat, following hunting. So now this is an example of what we did regarding some of these things. Um, one is, uh, and I'm, I'm not going to go through this whole chart, but if you have a look at it, we're looking at management options evaluation worksheet sheet on agricultural geography. Um, just to give you an idea, looking at the colors, you'll see there was a high level of consensus and support for, uh, with anything with a green dot, 
The blue indicates medium support, medium feeling that this may be effective, it could be effective. And, and the red indicates low support for it. So I'm not going to go through each of these things. Each of these are divided into the five different areas, conflict reduction, population reduction, fertility control, administration, and, um, and then the last column is crop, crop uh, protection. Um, we did, but in this, I'll give you just a quick example here on agricultural, because we still have quite a bit to get through. Um, we've blocked out landscaping alternatives there because we felt that just did not, wasn't applicable in an agricultural setting. It may be in other settings, but not an agricultural one. So we didn't bother evaluating it. Um, we looked at, uh, for example, hazing and frightening and the effectiveness for the individual. It was a marked red, which indicates that we don't think it's a, a good option. It's a particularly good option for the individual. And we're talking mostly here about farming, people farming. Um, we didn't feel also either that it was effective in addressing the root cause and a broader impact either in the next one lower down. Um, feasibility and the capacity to, to do it all. It's a lot of work, it's a lot of effort, it's ongoing. Uh, it may contain things like dogs unleashed, which is illegal, um, or other noise factors that may disturb the neighbors. It may chase deer onto busy roadways, causing other conflicts, as, and so forth. Um, we got, it, it didn't cost as much as other types of uh, options, so it got a, a green there, we like that. And also, it didn't take as long to do, so it got another green. Um, however, we didn't feel that the neighbors would be too happy if you're doing all the sonar things or um, dogs on the loose, etc. So for support and enthusiasm, it got a low uh, rating. It also got it for the fact that it, meant it kept a lot of people busy, farmers busy when they had better things to do. Um, and then finally, the negative community impacts. We just didn't feel it added anything to anybody's neighborhood, having all those kind of things going on. And spe specifically because it, we didn't feel it really, um, it would just move the deer from one place to another. And also, deer get very quickly habituated to sounds and deterrence. So that's how we went through that whole group of things. So if you, you, you may want to give all these a little more study. Um, I'm going to now hand this over to Bob, and he's going to go through some of the next areas with you. Thank you, Jocelyn, and thanks for the opportunity to be here today. I wanted to preface my remarks with a bit of background on me, because many, many people have asked me over the last few months, why on earth did you volunteer for that? And I must say, I've been asking myself that same question. <laughs> um, I volunteered because I have a, a very broad background in a number of areas, and I had hoped that they would be of help uh, to the committee. I'm normally a very modest individual, and I don't like beating my own drum, but to understand the depth and complexity of things we had to deal with, I will share that I am a professional agrologist, a registered professional biologist. I've worked on and studied deer on Vancouver Island and Sydney Island. I'm an instructor of the Provincial Hunter Training Program. I'm a former rancher and farmer. I'm presently a gardener in Machosan, the best place on earth. <laughs> <laughs> but I am only one of nine very uh, dedicated, and talented individuals that put in at least 100 hours each on this. We're a very diverse group of people, but I have complete confidence in our report and our recommendations, and I believe we stand united on the recommendations that we bring to you today. Okay, so in terms of actual recommendations, we'll first of all look at, oops, <laughs> helped you. <yeah. laughs> mm. Yeah, to advance, okay, good. So in the agricultural geography, 
We viewed the desired outcome as the ability to address economic loss in agricultural areas by reducing deer population to acceptable levels, maintain the population at that level by improving programs and tools for farmers to minimize crop losses. I don't think I have time to go through each of the recommendations in any depth. I will pick out a few and would certainly be willing to answer any questions you might have afterwards. I think you will see the first uh, short-term recommendation increase the effectiveness of hunting appear again in the rural geography. We wish to note that this is an, an existing legitimate use and what we are re recommending is that it be um, improved so that there are perhaps longer seasons, increased bag limits and better access. Those recommendations are detailed in the report. We also recommend exploring opportunities to support and expand the First Nations harvest. It was critical to have First Nations representation on our group. I myself have worked with First Nations for over a decade and I know of the profound respect held for food animals, so that was a very important thing to, to consider. We suggest improving the crop protection program and also implementing various population reduction measures. And again, those are detailed in our report. A uh, number of other recommendations there for the short term, and then moving down to the medium term, where we recommend uh, the preliminary evaluation of the above, the short term actions and outcomes, and also to adjust those short term measures. Uh, this is what I call adaptive management. So you'd adjust those measures based on the outcomes from the preliminary evaluation and continue with the implementation program. Moving on to the next geography, which is the rural geography. The desired outcome there, again, reduce the deer population to natural levels outside of settled areas and provide rural residents with measures to reduce deer-human deer conflicts to within the range of individual tolerance levels. Recommendations uh, in the immediate short term, develop partnerships between local, regional, provincial governments, and NGOs for implementing these various options. For example, animal control bylaw officers, anglers, and hunters associations. We also recommend removing regulatory barriers to fencing, so restrictions around uh, height of fence, placement of fence, and so on, that will certainly assist. Again, population reduction measures to that uh, acceptable level, uh, and again, increasing the effectiveness of, of hunting. So you'll see that uh, although we explored many, many options, there is a recurring theme throughout the recommendations because they're um, not everything that we explored was feasible or desirable. In the medium term, again, looking back to see what worked and doing that adaptive management to adjust uh, the measures based on uh, the, the, the preliminary outcomes. Moving on to the third geography, which we considered the urban geography. And our desired outcome there is to reduce the deer population to natural levels inside settled areas and provide urban residents with measures to reduce deer-human conflicts to within the range of individual tolerance levels. Short-term recommendations uh, promote a range of mitigating options for property owners, uh, both public and private. Encourage provincial government to delegate authority to local governments to deal with aggressive deer. Uh, we did see uh, in a lot of the uh, letters to the editor and to our, our group, uh, many people are concerned about uh, uh, public safety. It is a concern. A recommendation to encourage local governments to develop bylaws prohibiting deer feeding and to enforce that uh, bylaw requirement. Provide incentives for fencing that protects food and considers cost undertake bulk purchase and distribution of repellents, and consider impacts on deer habitat, such as wildlife corridors, with new developments in planning documents, official community plans, zoning bylaws, and so on. 
And again, the medium term recommendations are to go back, revisit, and see what worked and adjust the management options on that basis. We pulled out one group of concerns for special interest and that was around deer vehicle collisions and how to reduce those and we recommend some mitigation measures in our report. We suggest encouraging provincial government and municipalities to increase effectiveness of deer warning signage. So more signs, better signs. Partner with ICBC to increase driver education on deer vehicle collision mitigation. Explore partnerships with school districts to produce unique mobile signage to increase awareness. Uh, increase and extend the right-of-way brushing. Uh, consider designs to minimize uh, collisions with infrastructure master planning and revise speed limits in high collision areas. Uh, we encourage the CRD to incorporate deer vehicle collision mitigation measures into the regional transportation plan. We also have some overarching and long-term uh, recommendations uh, for the, the big picture, long-term um, situations. So here with deer vehicle collision mitigation for the entire region, uh, reduce the number of deer collisions, auto and cyclist is the desired outcome, and the recommendations um, are again what I had gone through basically. So those are the recommendations there for, um, for now. And then long-term for the entire region, again, monitoring the results of the immediate uh, changes. And that's our presentation. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Before we get to questions, I'm just wondering if any of the other members of the advisory committee I would like to add anything to that. Can I just interrupt, please? Uh, yes. I'd just like to introduce one more of our members who came along. Uh, Saul Kinnis. Saul uh, was part of the farming, agricultural people who were elected to this committee. And I also want to make one other point before we go there, and that is that we did also look at status quo, doing nothing, and I didn't mention it. Um, but we determined that, yes, it was cheap to do nothing at this point, it didn't cost anything, et cetera, but in the long term, it will cost a lot more. So we did not think that was a route to take. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Uh, take it, nobody on the committee who has anything else to add? Okay, then I'll open it up to, yes, go ahead, Bob. <coughs> um, thank you, there was uh, one section that was missing on the slideshow that is contained in our report. If you turn to page uh, 29, it is the overarching recommendations for the entire region, and there are five of those. So I will go through those uh, quickly if, if that's okay. Uh, number one, we're recommending the CRD establish an overall monitoring and reporting program to measure the effectiveness of the regional deer management strategy to be overseen by a permanent body with expert and citizen representation for deer issues and to make recommendations for change to the strategy. The second overarching recommendation Wherever population reduction measures are used, encourage techniques to be adopted and regulations to be changed to allow for meat to be used. The third recommendation, CRD should engage with First Nations on recommendations for deer management. Number four, encourage the CRD to establish a region-wide public education program to better inform the public of deer behavior and individual options to employ. And number five, and final overarching recommendation, increase public awareness of health concerns, for example, Lyme disease, through existing health services, nurse line, public health providers, clinics. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Now, we'll open the uh, meeting to questions to the committee. Committee members? Director Young. Uh, I, I wonder if you could um, give just a little more detail on some of the population reduction um, 
comments and recommendations, um, particularly a, a, a couple that I, I, I think we're going to have to wrestle with is um, the the issue of um, uh, professional sharpshooting in urban areas where obviously there are existing um, regulations uh, against uh, discharge of firearms and I think bows and arrows as well and I'd be interested in knowing if, whether that is actually used in urban areas. Um, the, the other uh, one that I'd like a little more discussion on is um, fertility control and immunocontraception and what the likely conditions are under which the province might approve uh, a pilot or experimental program, uh, what kind of geography, um, whether they might um, contribute to the cost uh, or what, and um, any other comments you might have with regard to the feasibility of that uh, option. Who, would somebody like to answer that? Rob? Okay. So, um, the, f the second part, do you have a... That works? There we go. Oh, geez. <laughs> I'm everywhere. Um, so for amino contraceptives, we were uh, told that, well, I guess everyone knows that they're, Ill they're currently not um, allowed in Canada to be used. Um, and we were told by, um, so the expert resource working group, that the, um, the only place that they would be effective would be in a very isolated um, population and that there aren't really any isolated populations within the CRD, that, that it would even be effective to propose some kind of pilot project and that would be the only way that you would be able to get that uh, drug to be used in Canada. Well, just to follow up, one of the things that we were told quite early in this process is that by a biologist from the provincial government, and I, I can't recall his name offhand, um, the comment he made was that uh, deer move very little, that most deer live within a few um, blocks or uh, 100 meters of where they're born. Mm -hmm. Now, obviously, anybody who knocks on doors in Fairfield and Oak Bay knows that they must move somewhat because we are seeing deer where we didn't see them before. But on the other hand, it suggests that um, in fact, um, maybe the occupation of new territories by deer is relatively slow and that if you uh, did have such a program or indeed any population control program, um, that the, the ecological niche wouldn't be p filled up all that quickly, that it might take in fact a few years uh, before a new population or a replacement population moves in if you limited the population through uh, contraception or, or indeed any other other method. So uh, I'm seeing a bit of a, uh, I'm, I'm having trouble understanding where, where the, the science is on that one. It's complicated. <laughs> um, Generally, it's felt that um, you know, eating vegetables is a learned behavior. So mom moves into an area, she has a couple of young every year, they learn the ropes in that area to get their food source. As the numbers increase, they would move outwards. So you could see new deer in new areas as part of that displacement outwards because of density issues. Uh, as far as invasion um, from native populations, Inwards, I would expect that there would always be some recruitment with animals um, becoming gradually more familiar with that really prime food source within the uh, more settled areas. So, uh, as I said, it's, it's complicated. I did want to speak to your first question about sharpshooting. And we recognize that's a very difficult thing to do, but there, <coughs> there are hunting methods that could be employed that would be 
more acceptable. So I think uh, discharge of firearms in Oak Bay would be a real stretch, but archery or crossbow hunting might be a possibility. But again, it's going to be difficult to do. Okay, anyone else? Uh, just, could I get you to shut the mic off? For, for those that are unfamiliar with our system, um, the red button turns your microphone on, but you have to turn it off when you're finished because it doesn't uh, adapt well to having many of them on. Thank you. Next, uh, go ahead. Sure, um, I'm Councillor Help, standing in for Mayor Fortin today. So um, thank you for the report. I have a couple of questions in terms of the outcomes and um, measurables. So for the agricultural geography management options on page 26, um, there's a footnote where it defines what an acceptable level is. Uh, it's kind of, it's not very specific as in we're not going to get rid of this number of deer, but at least there's some kind of measurable. Um, whereas for the rural geography and the urban geography, the, the outcome statement says that, you know, I, I don't need to read it, but the last part, to within the range of individual property owner tolerance level. I think that's, that, that might be something that we need to scratch because that's an absolutely impossible thing in some ways to measure. Um, so I just wondered if, uh, if there's some biological um, definition of natural levels that could be added as a footnote so that people can see consistency and also that we're, we're, gonna, we're saying this is our outcome and when we go to evaluate it, we'll have something tangible to evaluate it against. Um, Patrick, would you like to answer that question? Sure, at, le at least I'll give it a, a try. Um, you've hit upon one, one of the really, really tough questions that that we had to face. The, the scientists can't tell us exactly how many deer there are in the CRD. In particular, they can't tell us how many there are in, in, in urban areas. Um, and in effect, it is cost prohibitive to try and, and perhaps even impossible to do an accurate count. So the advice we received is to really to, to measure the, the incidents associated with deer population, the reported conflicts, the number of collisions. Um, in the agricultural area, it was relatively easy because you can focus back to crop loss, what was normally seen. It is more difficult in, in rural and, and urban. But the, the idea was uh, essentially to, um, I think the, the normal levels were when you weren't getting four phone calls a day from people in Fairfield seeing the same deer walking down the street, that it was a, a, a reduced incidence of, of conflict and that that would be the, the measure in the absence of any way to actually count the, the number of deer. And you know, I could just go back to the previous question about immunocontraceptive. One of the reasons why the province is, I think, reluctant to authorize a, a test in an urban area is the evidence is that you have to um, you have to sterilize a very large population, perhaps as many as 90% of the does, in order to be effective. So you don't need a whole lot of movement between areas to find that you're essentially continually chasing the the deer, trying to get up to that level. And if you don't, the evidence is deer reproduce at the rate of two or three per year. And so even with contraceptive, as long as the population, female population isn't taken down to zero, there will continue to be an increase in population. So I think their view was it, it's, it's kind of like chasing your tail, and they didn't really see the value of, of that, combined with the difficulties in getting the license in the, in the first place, because it's a, it's a federal license for use of the drug, not a provincial one. Sorry, that was a bit long-winded. Yeah, I just, I have a follow-up question. It just, again, um, taking the Chair's remarks at face value that we need to move forward with something that's um, operational and measurable, I would suggest, and we don't even have a motion on the table yet, which I appreciate, to, for both um, agricultural and urban that we might consider, and I'll just put it out there, striking to within the range of individu individual property owner tolerance levels uh, in both of those recommendations, because that's, that just said, well, it, it leaves it to individual tolerance rather than kind of a, a, a way of governing. So that would be my recommendation. And again, thank you for all your hard work. Director Dermott. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, first of all, uh, I won't say my, your nickname, but uh, first of all, um, 
I would like to thank the committee for the work that they've done. Uh, I think the report is quite complete. And I think the recommendation that ultimately is in front of us is an appropriate one because whatever we do uh, in this case is gonna be multi-jurisdictional and uh, there isn't a lot of sense approving a particular direction until we know that the jurisdictions involved are, are comfortable with that. However, one of the things I noted in here is, uh, and I think it's not unexpected, that the ability to control deer in rural and agricultural areas is probably a little bit easier than in the urban area, and certainly to, uh, to implement some uh, reduction strategies is very definitely easier. Functionally, what that has the potential to do is to establish a bit of a ring, uh, in a way almost a buffer zone around the urban area where there is less opportunity for in-migration and the internal population is somewhat isolated. So I'm wondering if, if that, in your opinion, might allow a situation where you, uh, you can do something like a immunocontraceptive program successfully in an internal area because it's, it's fundamentally surrounded by the area where you are carrying out the population reduction controls and therefore you're less likely to have uh, additional in-migration over time. You've actually put a ring around the urban area, a control zone in that respect. Well, one of the things about um, the studies that have been done is they have been un done under very controlled conditions. And we do know that once the deer are uh, um, sterilized, that they will live longer, the does live longer. So you still have the problem of these animals being there. It's not an effective reduction straight away. And because they're a, from a very um, uh, habituated usually to their own territories, uh, it, it's not a, a quick fix solution at all. The other thing is that uh, the FDA has not approved any immunocontraceptives in Canada. So the idea of the ring, I can see what you're getting at, but I think it's a pretty difficult thing to actually control. Well, I understand that, and I certainly understand it's not a quick fix solution. Mm -hmm. I don't think in the urban area there is a quick fix solution in all likelihood, but uh, we'll need to look at that in the future. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, Director Alto, and then Cullington. Uh, thank you, and <laughs> thank you, really, to the committee. What a thankless job you had. <laughs> so for whatever motivated you to, to volunteer, uh, really kudos to you for doing so. I had a couple of quick questions um, and then a comment, and, and a couple of my questions are specific, and you may not be able to answer them. But on page 19 of your report, there's a reference under population reduction to uh, current prohibition on the sale of wild meat. Can you remind me, or do you know, is that provincial authority? Is that why we have a current sale? Of and a sale of wild meat. Uh, that's correct. The Provincial Wildlife Act just prohibits specifically the sale of wild meat. Okay, thank you. And uh, I'm not sure, again, a similar question, but uh, on page 20, there's a reference under capture and euthanize, a description of uh, conventional humane killing uh, methods. And I'm wondering, is that, um, do you know if that's approximately the same technique we use in dealing with commercial cattle kill? I'm sorry, I missed the last part of that. Is that. Do you know if that's the similar technique that's used in commercial cattle kill? When we kill cattle to eat them? Um, Feedlots yeah. and whatnot? Similar process? Yeah, it is? the bulk of it. But you know, one recurring theme we heard from several members on the expert working group was that any handling of wild animals can be extremely traumatic and um, very frequently, the animals uh, hurt themselves in trying to, you know, deal with that situation. So, the, and um, again, after release, they become very disoriented, and there are lots and lots of perils to be considered in handling wild animals. Yeah, I understand that, and, and I guess part of my uh, question stems from a, a gap that I see in the report, which I think is otherwise excellent. And there's, I didn't see any analysis or consideration about the uh, option of looking at managing deer as a crop. Uh, many countries in the world, New Zealand among them, uh, do look at the management of deer uh, in the same way that we manage cattle. And in fact, in New Zealand, it's one of their major uh, cash crops, and in fact, an export crop, both for venison and antlers and various other products. 
And it seemed to me that if we were looking in the long term uh, and looking towards a way to deal with an issue that is not going to go away easily uh, and which does require a certain amount of innovation and uh, sort of future think, it would be an interesting notion to have it in the mix with all of these other really I don't know, excellent ideas uh, to start considering whether or not this is an opportunity for us to look from the perspective of uh, food security for one, from one perspective, but also about uh, an innovative use at a crop that seems to be with us, whether we like it or not, and uh, whether this is something that we could actually begin to encourage in the agricultural sector in particular, uh, an interest in a long-term view at uh, managing deer as a, a food source. Did that come up at all? And um, not in that form because of that prohibition against the sale of wild meat. Now, um, a number of years ago, there were quite a few fallow deer farms in British Columbia, but I understand that the market just wasn't there. Something similar has happened with elk ranching in Alberta. The number of elk ranches have decreased too. And I don't know if it's around public acceptability of game meat uh, in, in a supermarket, mm -hmm. but there have been marketing concerns. So I'm, yeah, I'm not I aware. I understand there's issues around marketing, and I certainly would, this would be another area where we'd have to engage the province in a discussion about regulations uh, and all sorts of quality control and all sorts of things. But I do think that uh, it's something that might be uh, in the mix as we discuss the future of this report and what uh, options may be before us, because uh, again, I don't think that this is an issue that's going to go away, even if we were to apply all of these measures. Uh, and I do think that in the context of a lot of other uh, issues, as I say, around food security, et cetera, that this is something that, that uh, actually should be on the table. Just a couple of, uh, last couple things. Uh, in the recommendations around both uh, agricultural geography and uh, rural geography, in the report it references a few times around having uh, enhanced training programs for potential hunters. And I don't see that specifically referenced in the recommendations uh, in the immediate or short term under the increased effectiveness of hunting section. So I just would, would suggest that perhaps that be added in because I do think that would give a lot of folks uh, greater comfort, uh, as the chair had mentioned earlier, around the applicability of these types of programs, whether they're in agricultural uh, or rural sections. And I guess just my final comments are to do with the urban um, management option recommendations. And uh, those are on page 28. And uh, in number seven, where it talks about population reduction measures, um, I guess for me another related comment would be I would want to see this type of uh, work done around sharpshooting, et cetera, really only in conjunction with a series of very strict regulations, including training and licensing. Uh, I do think that the comments that have been made by other uh, directors is very salient for the urban population, that there would be a lot of anxiety around introducing this kind of a program unless was, there was certainty and a, a great deal of assuredness around the fact that there was absolutely strict regulation with really highly qualified people under very strict circumstances. So I think that would merit a uh, very specific recommendation uh, mentioned there. And I guess um, the part for me that um, I, I would have some trouble with is higher up on that page, under immediate and short term items two and four, where it says encourage provincial governments to delegate authority to local governments to deal with aggression and then to provide incentives for fencing, et cetera. You know, I do understand that there is merit to that from the perspective of allowing local authorities to deal with a local problem. But I, I worry about the extra cost on municipalities, uh, which I think is something that would need to be very carefully examined. Uh, and I'm also a bit concerned just in general about, frankly, letting the provincial government off the hook. I mean, when we come back to the basic of this, basis of this, this is wildlife management. And this should not be under either the regional authority or the municipal authority. Uh, and I, I do think that the guts of these recommendations are practical and you know, they'll need to be examined, uh, I think, at some length about their applicability and how it would actually work. The bottom line here is that we're letting the province shirk its duties. Uh, and I know that the CRD and other regional districts have tried to get the province to act in other areas uh, without much success. But I really think that message has to be paramount. However we move forward, the province can't be let off the hook here. And it shouldn't all be delegated to the municipal and regional authorities. And I think that's a very important message to deliver as we move forward. Thank you. I believe we have an answer uh, from the panel for your, one of your questions. Great. Yeah. I guess it wasn't so much. Could you turn your microphone on, please? Thank you. Again, sorry about that. Um, first of all, before I make comments, um, I just want to thank the, the board and the committee members here for allowing me to participate and add my two cents worth from, I guess, a, a different viewpoint than many have uh, read. Um, I, I just want to use an analogy um, and tell you a story first about um, where I'm coming from, I suppose you could say, in terms of 
my um, input into this process. Um, my wife, is, she is from the Yukon, and very true people of the land, so to speak. Um, she was relating a story to me when I was um, allowed to be a part of this committee. And in, back in the day, she was told about um, a process that her, her elders used to, um, to participate in, I guess you could say. Um, the elders and the hunters of the communities that she came from uh, monitored and kept track of, of wolf cups, wolf dens, really, in, in the wide range of her territory. And each spring, they would go and monitor the, the litters and re literally do a, a cull of the litters, um, mostly females, but again, in respect of, of nature, they didn't wipe out the litter. They would l take half, maybe. But and they did this not because they didn't like them, and it was definitely competition for the moose, which they used as a very valuable resource, but they did it just to keep it in check. And it was not of malice, and it was not of hatred for these wolves, you know, even though they were acknowledged and recognized as competition. But it, w it was much needed. And in some sense, I see this call as uh, with very limited um, options um, similar to that. We may like deer, we may not like them, but in some instances, I believe it's necessary. Uh, so, in terms of hunting, you know, I am a hunter. My, I promote it within my community. Um, we do hunter training programs in my community. We use it as a, a very valuable food source, um, organic food source, for, um, for that matter. And we use it for that, but we use, you know, the, the hides for drums and other cultural implements that, you know, so nothing is really wasted. But we also use it as a teaching tool, you know, and I've done presentations to <coughs> communities up, up at UVic, at tra uh, traditional food conferences um, in our communities at UVic, like I mentioned. And we use it, use the animal um, for what it is, you know. It's, it's a part of nature, you know. It provides food for my community. We teach hunting skills. We teach respect of nature. We give reverence to that animal because that animal has lost its life. And, you know, I don't take that lightly if I were to make recommendations in regards to a cull. Um, you know, in terms of the comments or the questions about sharpshooting, now, uh, that is a, spe a specific form of, of hunting. It's, uh, you know, you can, you can consider a hunter, um, whether they use a bow or whether they use a firearm, a, a form of a sharpshooter, because, you know, the ultimate is a one shot, one kill. You know, you don't want to leave that animal suffering. You know, that definitely is paramount in, in any hunter's um, notebook, I guess you could say. Um, in, in, in our training and in, in our teachings, that's, that's what we um, strive for. You know, in, in my community, we have the capacity and something that we've practiced and something that I've, I've worked very hard at, at building the capacity of, of individuals in my community to be able to do this. Um, my, my wife, like I mentioned, she grew up in this kind of environment where as, at a young age, she learned to respect that animal. Um, again, not take the killing of this, these animals lightly. And so in, in the process from field to freezer to frying pan, so to speak, um, everything is done with the respect that that animal deserves. And we definitely promote that in, in, in all our um, teaching in our community, like I said, from proper butchering practices, proper freezing practices, proper cooking practices, or making it as healthy as possible. So with that, you know, uh, going back to the sharpshooting question, there are ways of 
dealing with these these animals that are aggressive or um, in some cases uh, overpopulated. Um, the idea, I'll, I'll, I'll talk specifically about your ring. You know, there, uh, I was asked that comment, uh, that question, and my comment to that was, it will work in some cases, but there's just too much parkland, open um, fields, wild, wild areas, the parks and, you know, all of those that, that aren't covered by the ag agricultural area, so they will migrate through those corridors. And yes, it may reduce some of the populations, but, and it goes back to deer. They're, the deer, they don't read the reports by the biologists, so they, you know, they, you know, they don't always follow what the biologists say. You know, and I, and I say that with humor, but it's true. These are urban deer. Most of the biologists, their, their training, I guess you could say, comes from, I would assume, most of it is from wild animals. You know, the, the counts, the deer counts, we could not um, get exact numbers, even in the wild. You know, the, the, their estimates, best, best guesses, best estimates. In regards to the different types of hunting, and, and again, go back to the sharpshooting, you know, from an elevated position, you know, hunters do it all the time with, with bows and with, with um, firearms. So there are, there are ways of, of doing sharpshooting within select, and I, and, and I want to emphasize that, select settings, whether you're in the urban agriculture or rural setting. There are select settings that, um, that need to be followed. And in terms of hunter training, hunters need to be trained regardless. And if you're going to promote specific, excuse me, my mouth is getting dry here, um, specific settings, then those trained individuals should, because they're professionals, should know those settings. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. So, again, those, those recommendations weren't made lightly. Um, and just my own comments to this process, one of the things that I do fully support is public education regarding this, this issue. We as, as, as a committee, and I also sat on the expert resource working group as well, we were educated. We were educated in three, four months. Now this, again, it's a long-term um, solution in, in, this, in this report. So it, it needs to be looked at it in that fashion. Initially, sure, you can do mass media um, public education spots. But over the long term, it does need to be over and over, repetition, repetition, repetition. Um, you know, because in the media and some of the advocacy um, group um, outlay of information, some of it was just wrong. You know, some of it was biased, definitely. You know, some of it was um, put out of context in terms of what it was. Um, so just as we were educated, the public will need to be educated as well. And I, and I see it as a long-term solution. And as people are educated, they'll teach their children, they'll teach their friends and neighbors. You know, and throughout, and I'm sure it's probably the same with the other committee members, some, some discussion came up in our everyday lives in regards to this. And a lot of that wrong information was out there. You know, if, if the general public were given some of the information about really how inhumane is it to transport capture and transport deer. You know, deer come under a lot of stress and it's in more inhumane to transport them and cause that stress to them which lead to high mortality rates. If the general public knew that specific piece of information and where to locate the data regarding that, how, how would they really um, would they really support that option? And, and the same with the other options that, that were put forward or disregarded. You know, we, we were fortunate on this committee 
to have that detailed information and actually by some of the people that created that data. So again, public education is, is key and paramount. Um, in regards to anecdotal information, I know that was a, that was a big issue that was brought up in the media and, and, and by some people. Anecdotal information to me, for example, um, when, I, when I received my traditional medicines from elders or people in my community, I didn't question, I don't question them. If I know and that they tell me it's good for me and it's going to help me, I don't ask for scientific proof. I have a bit of faith and trust that after years and generations of being shown these medications or this food source, I have a bit of faith in that. Um, my colleague Pat here talked about the best guess information. He, he mentioned that, you know, sometimes we have to go on that um, best guess information and account how many phone calls, how many letters have been written, how many times has this been brought up, and, and have faith that those people are afraid of those aggressive deer. They are afraid of Lyme disease. And if you look at the stats, even though they are as small as they are, Lyme disease here in Victoria is probably one of the more, um, well, I guess, you know, again, the numbers are quite small, but there are more cases of Lyme disease here on the South Island than most places in the province. So again, those, that's backed by data, but some unfortunately cannot be backed up by data. We just have to have faith in that those constituents are telling the truth. So again, I'm, I'm starting to take a bit much more of your time, but um, I appreciate, again, thanking, thanking each and every one of you for allowing me to have my say and give my viewpoint from from my community. Thank you so much. Well, thank you. That was very informative. Um, we have uh, Directors Cullington and Daly. Thank you. Um, and thank you, all of you. I think it was an extraordinarily well done report in an incredibly short period of time. You obviously had some very, very intense discussions. Um, but it's also clear that, that you're also sitting there as a group of people who have developed a lot of respect for each other and, and sort of knowing that you came from a lot of different backgrounds, I think that kind of, you know, really helps to give this committee confidence that you've kind of come at this, as you say, sort of not from an emotional point of view, and it is a very emotional subject, but from really a very hard-headed point of view and, and sort of working with the best information that's available to, to give us um, what you truly feel to be your, your best advice, and I think your, your recommendations are, are excellent. A um, couple of comments and a couple of, of questions. Um, I like the way you did, sort of it made sense to do the three-way split into sort of agricultural and urban and, and rural. Um, and I'm aware that sort of even beyond that, there's a kind of a, a level of complexity beyond, um, you know, even when I look at simple things like that traffic accident image, you know, it was, I don't know if Highlands drive more carefully than Machosan, but you know there were, there were more in Machosan than Highlands. So, you know they, they are different, and, and when I look at sort of Colwood being included um, in the urban area, which makes sense, less of an issue for us. Clearly, sort of Victoria Oak Bay have, have experienced some very significant issues. So you know there's there's all kinds of levels of complexity within complexity. Um, I think there are going to be some recommendations that are kind of terribly easy for us all to, to get behind, you know, banning feeding is a fairly straightforward thing to do, doing the education um, around collisions and, and, you know, how to sort of hopefully reduce um, deer is, is probably um, also fairly easy, although I deeply appreciate um, the comment around, you know, we need to do that kind of long-term thinking about how we do um, not just the kind of moving away from kind of those specific trigger areas that we have right now, but how we also think about doing that kind of long-term prevention um, of it becoming an issue in areas that it isn't currently an issue. It's, it's certainly something that's, that's region-wide for us to, to focus on. Um, I think it, it comes through loud and clear that, that, you know, one of our very first priorities has to be um, around the agricultural lands and, and areas with sort of um, particularly high impact 
Um, and it's also clear to me, and this is not intended to be a bad pun, um, that we're going to have to bite the bullet on population reduction. Um, we are going to, it's going to be very hard for a lot of people to, to accept, and we are going to take a lot of flack for it. Um, and, you know, nobody, I think it was the chair who used the, the wonderful term, nobody wants to kill Bambi. Um, and I think that's absolutely right. We, you know, they're beautiful creatures. Um, but I, I, Mr. Jim's comment about respect, I think, really resonated very well with me. Thank you. Um, so, a couple of, of questions. Um, you talk in your recommendation about reducing to, to natural levels, and yet we're in un mostly unnatural environments. And I wondered whether you had any advice for us in terms of how you, what's a natural level? Well, thank you, Councillor Collington. Um, Lisa, would you be willing to talk to that? Oh, sure, I'll give that a try. Okay. Um, thank you. <laughs> I, I'm not a population ecologist, but I do you know, study that a bit at UVic and, and teach about uh, resource management in that context. And it is a problematic term when you talk about natural levels. It's really beyond the scope of this report to come up with an optimal population number, and especially as, as, you, as you alluded to. It's very difficult when the, the environment itself is now so different, we can't be sure that a natural level would be appropriate. So things like carrying capacity would have to be considered and whether it's sustainable. I mean, some people may feel it's all right to have a higher than normal deer level in the a population in, in this area, but the question is what will the deer be eating? Um, if we don't want them to eat crops or gardens or rare or native plants, then that doesn't really leave them much leeway. So again, that's the question. The exact number would have to be studied uh, by people who, who've been looking at deer populations, especially in urban areas. You know, the whole issue about what Aboriginal people would be thinking about, about what they feel is an appropriate level. It's uh, one that would take a, a while to resolve, but it's something that, that we felt that we really couldn't step in and start to come up with actual numbers without more information on that. If I might add to that, um, humans have had a profound effect on natural population levels for at least 150 years on Vancouver Island. If you walk through a climax Douglas fir forest, you'll see very, very little understory. There's nothing there for the deer to eat. We have very little climax forest left on Vancouver Island. Pretty much everything has been harvested. We're into second growth and third growth, and uh, those are much better habitats for deer. So we really can't establish a number for a natural level because it depends on where you go and how far you want to go back. But I think what we're saying is that we want the levels in these areas that we looked at to be more like admit, admittedly altered population levels, but lower than the areas that we did look at. Okay, thank you. Uh, you're, you're done, Just Director Cullen? One ahead. more question, if okay. I may. Um, and it's a, a follow-on from um, Director Alto's question around um, I remember when we, we had the presentation and we were talking to folks from Cranbrook and they were talking about using the meat for, you know, food banks, First Nations, sale to, to restaurants. Um, do we, is there an option for us to, to go to the province and look for approval for the sale of wild meat or is that off the table? I think that's one of the things that would be covered under the recommendation, under the, yeah. Um, We'll go on to Director Daly, but first, uh, Director Cullington, I just checked the, the uh, map, and uh, as I suspected, uh, Colwood actually had a lot more collisions than Machosen did, so. <laughs> <laughs> Guilty as charged. <laughs> <laughs> Director Daly. Um, th <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chair. I think my, um, I had my hand up for comments that are more appropriate to uh, be made under the next uh, agenda item, so I'll save them for that, so I just want to, uh, join my colleagues in congratulating and thanking the uh, CAG for the work that they've done. I think it's uh, not only uh, for coming forward and putting your names forward to be selected uh, for this committee, but for hanging in there as well, because uh, certainly over the course of the process, uh, through emails and letters to the editor, et cetera, there were uh, a number of stinging comments and remarks that I think fair enough to be directed at the politicians, but 
certainly as you folks coming forward as volunteers, I don't think should have had to uh, to uh, hear, listen to, put up with. So I congratulate you for coming forward and hanging in there. I think the uh, report is concise, it's an easy read, and it gives us uh, a number of options. So it's not just, here's the report, thanks. And uh, so it gives us uh, a lot of information, very concise and a lot of options. So I look forward to the next step, but I've got some comments on the staff report. But again, thank you for your uh, all your work. Okay, anyone else with questions to the committee? No, well then we'll move on. Oh, do you have something you'd like to add? Yeah. Go ahead. I just wanted to speak to the question around food security, because for me, I actually don't look at this as a call, I look at it as, as a large area in which we're managing a crop, we're managing a food source. And I came into this process thinking, why is it that we're allowing one food source to eat another food source and then buying food from outside of, off the island from California or from some other place, particularly meat that could be raised in factories or, and really truly treated poorly. So I think if we can conceptually also not think of it as a call, but think of it as we are managing a food source, we're managing an organic food source, and, and think of the best ways that we can do that. Okay. Thank you. Now, um, we'll move on to, and this is to do with the recommendation, Director German. Yes. Before we do that, I'd like to ask Mr. Lapham, uh, could you just uh, basically enlarge on what the, uh, the outcome of the um, recommendation would be? There is some confusion here on that. So. Sure, Mr. Chairman. So uh, staff have uh, received the report from the committee and uh, provided you with a number of alternatives, and I'll just distinguish between them. But our recommended uh, uh, option is to, for you to receive this report and refer it back to us to uh, convene a meeting with municipal representatives, the provincial government, First Nations, and other uh, agencies to look at uh, how to move forward on, on these measures, what some of the uh, practical considerations are, and to ensure that uh, we have support from those agencies in, in actually looking at feasible uh, implementation options. So some of the things you've mentioned today around uh, amending uh, hunting regulations, looking at uh, the use of uh, uh, deer meat in a commercial uh, capacity, some of the uh, implications around uh, safety regulations uh, in, in municipalities as well as uh, the feasibility of uh, whether municipalities want to continue to participate in this process uh, as a group or individually or uh, what role the CRD might have. So that's the intent behind the recommendation. Uh, the alternatives were to receive this report and just advance it up to the board without uh, sort of that kind of uh, consideration and uh, that would uh, solicit delegations. Uh, we feel that uh, that would be premature uh, given some of the feasibility issues to be looked at. And then third option we did have in our terms of reference was the option to look at a public opinion survey. And uh, given the way, and, and that was in advance of the recommendations from the CAG, so given the way these recommendations have come forward, we feel that uh, there wouldn't be further benefit in uh, canvassing that, given the, the level of education and awareness uh, people would have to have around these various options and uh, some of the issues that the members have mentioned. So does that, uh, I think, Yeah, assist? thank you, Bob. That's, yeah. uh, that clarifies it, I think. Um, I have Director Derman and then, um, yeah. Thank you, Mr. Follow. Chair. Um, I will move the recommendation of this seconder. I'll speak to it. Thank by you. Director uh, Durbin, second by uh, Director Blackwell. Um, again, uh, certainly one of the things in there is thanking the committee, and uh, I think that's very, very important. Uh, but at this stage, we have the report. It is advice to this committee, and this committee will have to make decisions that are part based on practicality, and in part probably, unfortunately, based on uh, political impact. Um, so, w and we're, as I mentioned earlier, this is going to involve uh, a multi-jurisdictional program, and so I think it's very appropriate at this time that this uh, go the route, the recommendation is suggesting that the various jurisdictions who, get, who will be involved uh, get together and report back to this committee on how they see uh, aspects of this report being implemented. Once that's done, then we can wrestle with the issue of uh, exactly uh, what kind of decisions this committee is prepared to make. Um, it will be important also that we do provide the opportunities 
in future meetings, as I'm sure we're going to, for uh, other, asp other members of the general public to make presentations. I'm quite sure we'll have more than one. Thank you. Okay, I've got um, Directors Bryson and Daly, and I missed a couple of hands. Uh, Director Blackwell, okay. Brown off. Go ahead, Director Bryson. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, <clears throat> I really do appreciate the, the work that the Citizens Advisory Group has put into the report. Um, I think, uh, as the Chair had uh, uh, suggested, uh, we are receiving the wisdom of the crowd here. I really appreciate uh, that approach, and uh, it's a philosophy that I can, I can understand and appreciate. So thank you very much. Um, I think it has been a significant effort on the part of all the, the members and uh, um, the, the commitment that you've made to sticking through a, a challenging process, I think, uh, uh, is a credit to you as a group. And um, I'm seeing a, a group that has, uh, has worked very cohesively, and I, I appreciate that. I think it, it speaks thank well you. for the outcome. So thank you for that. Um, in terms of uh, the next step, I appreciate the, uh, the, the clarification from Mr. Lapham with respect to how he, he plans to proceed if this motion is adopted. I can certainly support the motion. Um, I agree that uh, uh, in order to come up with a, a practical and effective, uh, and cost effective for that matter, uh, implementation plan uh, in a timely manner it's going to be important to include uh, all of the jurisdictions that uh, will inform that implementation plan or, or allow that implementation plan, perhaps. And so uh, I think it is important that we uh, now take it back to the province and, and as one director said, uh, perhaps uh, get them on the hook in terms of we've done some significant work here on their recommendation that we do that work, Mr. Chair, as, as you said in your opening comments. and. Uh, um, I think that the time is now to go back to the province and say, well, we've, we've done some, some work here and uh, hopefully uh, we can uh, encourage you to participate in an in implementation plan going forward. So I, I can wholeheartedly support the, uh, uh, the recommended uh, motion and uh, I would just like to add that um, I think there is a growing uh, sentiment in the community that they do want to see uh, action on this item uh, and sooner rather than later. I think it's, it's important that we uh, do keep moving uh, forwards. Uh, the, the farmers in the, in the region, and particularly I'm going to speak for the farmers in Central Saanich, um, have been impacted again for another growing season this year. And uh, it's essential that uh, uh, if we are truly committed to uh, retaining our agricultural land base and the economic viability of that agricultural production that we uh, remove this burden from the farmers in the area. So thank you very much. Thank you. Dr. Daly. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, further to your comments opening this meeting, Mr. Chair, and uh, um, Director Bryson's uh, comments just now of the um, the timeline, that, that's my concern with respect to this recommendation. Um, yeah, before you know, I mean, there was legitimate concern and hope that we, we would do something for this growing season, and we knew that when we went into this process that couldn't happen, but I think the timeline that we've started this and had this report, I think we've made great strides, but I am concerned about um, having something out of the CRD, out of the board, a decision by the board, certainly in time for the next growing season. I'm a little concerned that uh, I think the vagueness of this recommendation will lead us uh, well into perhaps the new year and we may not be farther enough down the path. So I've got some comments. I don't, of course, have the answers, but I'd like to hear some more debate or some comments on that. Um, you mentioned at the opening, Mr. Chair, a lot of these recommendations depend on the province coming in. Well, we've seen in bigger issues like the sewer issue, Blue Bridge issue, things like that, the province doesn't really respond too quickly when the CRD asks them some questions and asks them to get involved. And if we recognize that a lot of this depends on the province, I'm concerned right out of the gate as to uh, how timely we'll be able to move for the next growing season. Um, my other comment on the recommendations, I'm wondering if we can be more specific as to what we want the municipalities uh, 
the purview of the review to be. I, I wonder if we shouldn't be saying, uh, put more specific uh, wording around it, like here's the recommendations, tell us are these, uh, are, are they applicable to your jurisdiction? Are they, do you have bylaws that prevent any of these? If, if, if so, which ones? Would you be amenable to looking at reviewing your bylaws? I just think sending it out and saying, here you are, what do you think? Um, so that's another concern I have. Um, I'm wondering if we need to send all the recommendations to all the jurisdictions. Uh, some, some of them clearly aren't applicable to all of them. Uh, so should we say, here it is, but you know, um, look at the ones that are applicable to you and get back to us. So uh, along those uh, comments, I'm wondering if we shouldn't, in fact, put a timeline along with our recommendation that we're looking at responses by a certain date. And lastly, Mr. Chair, I just think we should add to number to the recommendation, including specifically the First Nations, which aren't uh, included specifically, but I, I suspect they're meant to be included. But I think it, in accordance with the overall arching uh, um, recommendations and number three, I, I, and I think obviously with their important uh, inclusion on the CAG, I think they should be included specifically in the recommendation. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. I'm, I've, uh, I've got confidence that Mr. Latin is, uh, is prepared to put uh, sufficient pressure on the province and understands fully the timelines. Do you want, do you want to comment to that, uh, Bob? Mr. Chairman, so uh, we have, have said this discussions. We built a relationship with the Export Resource Group in terms of uh, having some connections in this process and, and awareness. And uh, I think a lot of senior officials are aware that, that this is pending. Uh, with respect to municipalities, we, we saw having uh, municipalities uh, nominate someone to come forward to a meeting, uh, bring everybody together once rather than a prolonged referral process. Uh, particularly with First Nations, it does take a long time to uh, visit each First Nation and we rely on our, again, our relationship we've established to, to bring them together uh, in an immediate fashion. So. Uh, it's not an exact science. Uh, we, we know this is a priority of the board to, uh, to make this an action-based plan. And uh, other than uh, you, you imposing a timeline on us, uh, we'll, we'll make it a priority as, as we can within our program. Okay, Director Blackwell. Thank you. And I too want to thank the committee. It's, uh, it was a thankless job and we've got some reasonable, practical and fiscally sound recommendations that we can move forward with and I don't want to see this getting into some kind of an interminable uh, loop but I was the recommendation isn't specific to it but what I heard Mr. Lapham say was more of a staff to staff with uh, provincial municipal and CRD officials getting together to get some specific recommendations because the the concern that I had with the report is that there are certain things that the CRD can do, certain things that the municipalities can do, and certain things that we need permission from the province to do. And so I would like to see when the recommendations come back that there's, they're sort of um, blocked out into recommend that the CRD immediately proceed with and specify the things that we can do, uh, request that the municipalities change their bylaws with regard to feeding of deer and uh, specify the, the provincial actions that we're going to encourage the province to take. So if it comes back in that kind of format where we can see where each of our municipalities can, can act immediately if we need to, or the CRD to move immediately, I think it would be more timely than, than just my fear with the recommendation as it was, but it was just gonna be referred off to municipalities and councils would get together and go, well, I move we receive and file this. <laughs> and I don't think that's an appropriate, uh, an appropriate action for this. I think we need to move in a very timely manner. And especially as the provincial, uh, peninsula reps have said, we need to get something going before the next growing season. Thank you. Thank you, Director Brownell. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. So uh, I wanna thank you as well because I'm sure you got more letters than I got, but I got some pretty, um, uh, direct letters and I kept saying let this committee do their job so uh, it was a thankless job but I think your recommendations are are really good I think that there's hope that we'll be able to move forward on some of these initiatives um, I too don't want to see this 
go into spin cycle uh, quite often. That's what, ha that's what happens. So Mr. Lapham's um, scenario of how it will work is very important. It does have to be uh, vetted through municipalities because throughout this document there are a number of things that are referred uh, that the municipalities should do, signage. All those things have to fit into a budget cycle, which is good timing now because we won't be, staff will, are preparing their budgets now and council won't sit down to go through the budget until uh, um, January. So in Saanich, we have, you know, we have the urban area, so we have our urban containment boundary, so we're lucky. Uh, we have all of these in our municipality because outside the urban containment boundary, we have rural lands and farmlands. Mm -hmm. And we have a real strong push, and I always have said this, I support the farming community and we need to uh, come forward with some initiatives that we can work on. Um, I did see that the recommendations or uh, from the report from staff did miss First Nations, so I'm glad that uh, Director, Alternate Director Daly put that in, but the other one that's missing is the federal government. Um, there's a role for the federal government in this around crop um, insurance or whatever, and I think they need to be at the table as well, so uh, especially around the agricultural part. So I'd like to see that put into it. I, um, I think that if it works the way Mr. Lapham is saying, I think it can be back to, this, to the board actually uh, before the end of the year very easily. And uh, I think from a municipality's perspective, there are a number of issues that we have to look at, just even in fencing. I, I didn't think Saanich's fence bylaw uh, was applicable in the rural and uh, agricultural lands, but I need to check that. I knew it was applicable in the urban area. Um, and we're already looking at that in Saanich. Uh, Saanich does, has developed um, wildlife corridors um, in uh, an area uh, off of Beckwith. We have a wildlife corridor that goes behind the development. And what came up at our council the other day was, what about the conflict between deer and people using that corridor? I lived in Jasper National Park for a few years, and I can tell you, um, if we develop these properly, it will be very beneficial to all of us. And uh, again, I just want to say thank you for this. And uh, you have my assurance, and I'm sure the group around here and even the board, that we're, we're going to move forward, and it's our commitment that your work is not going to be put on a shelf. So thank you. Thank you. We've got uh, Director Alto, then Loveless, Young, and Hill. Uh, thank you. I just wanted to reiterate what I think I heard from Mr. Lapham, and that was this, the idea that the comments that have been made today, specifically around um, comments on the actual recommendations, will be incorporated and don't require motions today. Is that correct? That's correct. Uh, I think we've kept this fairly uh, open ended, uh, mm -hmm. been recording all your comments, and I think uh, because of the discussion around impl uh, implementation, it's it's going to be a broader conversation and we'll, we would structure it similar to uh, Director Blackwell's uh, comment to identify those specific interests and where actions uh, are, are best directed or we recommend they're directed. Great, thank you very much. And then uh, just anticipating um, a process as Mr. Lapham has, on, has uh, outlined, uh, when in that process and how would it function, uh, there would be the opportunity for the public to comment when it comes back to the full board? That's how I've uh, anticipated this going, is that this will go back, we will find out what works, what doesn't. When the recommendations come back, the public will then be able to speak to the, the, the distilled version of what actually we are, you know, what will work and what is feasible. Okay. So yeah. that would be at a next, uh, a second uh, dedicated meeting such mm -hmm. as this, except that public input would be uh, enabled. Great, thank you very much. And so I would just add the urging of my colleagues that we uh, don't delay on this. I think that there's some important work that needs to be done in order to uh, add to the already good report. Uh, and there certainly needs to be conversations with uh, our colleagues at different levels of government, but I, I would certainly urge us not to lag on this, uh, not just for the sake of the uh, interests that have been expressed uh, to uh, deal with the agricultural issues, but I think that it is fair to say that uh, throughout the region there's concern that something actually get done. Uh, and there will be much debate on what that is, certainly even within these recommendations, and I look forward to that, but uh, overall I think it's our responsibility to move. So I, I would urge us to bring this back soon. Thank you. Okay, Director Loveless. Thank you. 
Yes, um, this certainly has been an issue ongoing for a long, long time. And uh, I'm our um, council appointee to the Peninsula Agriculture Commission. So I've heard over a, a long time um, some of the uh, difficulties um, that our, our farming community experiences. And then over time, it, it became an, an urban problem as well. And uh, it is extremely complicated. So I would add my congratulations to the courage of the folks that stepped up to the plate and uh, agreed to be on this committee. Uh, I don't think you can be thanked often enough. So uh, I will add my vo voice and my thanks. Um, uh, Key to all of this, of course, and it's been said before, is uh, public education. Uh, I participate in the Saanich Fair year after year after year, and not this year, but last year, we, we had a petition at the fair. And it was uh, very interesting um, to engage people that weren't necessarily country folk um, in the conversation. Very illuminating um, and uh, useful for me. And the other piece that I found extremely useful, and I, I um, I'm pleased to hear the uh, inclusion in an expert panel. Uh, I attended the UBCM conference last year and went to a session um, with provincial experts on this issue. And uh, I think in our approach to the provincial government, we would be making a mistake to just try to get them on the hook, which of course, uh, it, the financial hook is, is important. But they have so much experience and so much um, uh, information based on past practice and, and uh, other jurisdictional um, areas that, that have already done a lot of this. So um, it, yeah, I think it will be pivotal that those uh, folks are at the at the meeting, not every UBCM delegate goes to the <laughs> to listen to uh, wildlife concerns. So, when our council members are appointed and um, are at that, they will get that kind of information. And the other questions I had were around process, and they've been answered. And I'm happy with that. Thank, thank you, you, Director Young. Uh, well, thank you. I uh, first would enthusiastically endorse the first of the recommendations that we. Um, thank the members of the CAG and the Expert Resource Working Group. Um, one of the great um, advantages we have in this region is a, a wealth of um, talented and uh, educated and uh, experienced people who are willing to volunteer for committees like this. Um, and I think we've gained some enormously valuable um, information and recommendations. Um, I must admit I'm a little uneasy about the second uh, part of the motion um, simply because um, at the, the, this, the report has not yet been to the, uh, to the board. So I'm very conscious that we are uh, soliciting input on, on a report that the board has not yet endorsed, uh, I think we, we do have to look at this very much as an informal uh, process of, of consultation. Um, uh, I think, I, think um, I don't think we, we are likely to get, for example, uh, firm commitments on the part of the province, the provincial government or the federal government on policy changes, but we may get uh, informal feedback from officials as to uh, what kind of, of recommendations they, they might be prepared to, uh, to endorse and, and seek, uh, uh, seek confirmation of. And obviously there are a lot of, of areas where we overlap with um, uh, provincial and federal regulation, whether it's with regard to use of new drugs or um, uh, provisions for um, wildlife management or sale of meat and a whole lot of things. Uh, I think we'll also we, we also have to be clear that we're getting informal feedback from the, uh, from the municipalities as well. Um, uh, I, I, think, I think we should take Director Daly's advice and make it clear that um, we would like that input to be focused. Uh, really, on, only Saanich, I guess, has all three of the different geographies uh, yes. within it. Um, 
Uh, yeah, well, I'm, <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm mostly interested in getting um, responses from urban areas on urban recommendations and vice versa. I think, um, uh, I, I, don't, I don't think we really are trying to solicit um, views of municipalities with regard to things outside their boundaries, but clearly um, many of the recommendations w will require um, cooperation and partnership with the municipalities, and I think we may as well start doing that now. And uh, but I'm I am a little conscious that we are, uh, frankly, I think we we are moving forward pretty quickly on this. In in my view, we 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 um, we do have these recommendations. They I think um, uh, they've received a lot of support here, but um, I think that. Uh, before the board is prepared to endorse them, I know that the board will want to hear back from from our staff with regard to their conversations with provincial officials. I know we'll we'll all be talking to our colleagues at our own municipalities, and we'll be getting feedback directly from municipal staff and possibly from municipal councils. And of course, the board itself will want to hear from the public. So. At this stage, uh, I think we have to be cognizant that we have some good ideas, some good recommendations. Uh, we're feeling our way forward. We don't want this to die on the vine, so we're, we're trying to get some, some feedback. Um, but at this stage, we have to keep an open mind. As well, of course, we are going to want feedback from our staff as we move forward with regard to money, budget, costs and all those kinds of things that we are going to have to have in front of us as a board when we start to um, uh, consider final recommendations from, from this committee. Thank you. Director Hill? Yeah. Colleagues, uh, members of the, of the CAG and staff, I would um, first off like to start off with saying, I'd like to start off with saying, um, what is it I've learned? I have learned a great deal. I've learned a great deal about the subject, where I had first ex expect what I had first expected from the from the group was to be a li much lighter weight than what I've witnessed. Mm -hmm. What I have witnessed is a respectful process, where the values that we are dealing with here in terms of wildlife, urban life, and our own lives are blending together in an ever changing mosaic. This is not trivial because what I'm looking at and been thinking about quite a bit is that nature is very adaptable. It shapes its habits to the opportunities. It shapes its form to what's there. And what I've heard and what I've seen is that we, unless we act, we, unless we take an active role in managing ourselves and those circumstances around us, we will end up with a bigger problem in very short order. So I, first off, must respect the work that's been done. Thank you for the time. Thank you for the courage. Thank you for the leadership to staff, to the members, and my chair. The next thing is, I think that there's been a certain amount of uncertainty around the, th the second recommendation. I'm not very comfortable in the way it's framed and taking that forward to the board. Not because it's, uh, it's because it's clarity when it, if you don't put the context of what we've just heard and listened to and have struggled with over the while around that second portion, that it could be so easily misread. A recommendation to do nothing. It needs to be shaped in some kind of a report that brings together a progressive implementation plan strategy Director Hill, if I may, this recommendation is not going to go to the board. This no, this is to us. This is, yeah, this will come back to us, to, us. to a dedicated committee, and then a recommendation will go to the board. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. That's, that helps me a great deal. Thanks. The, the elements that I, I wanted to also touch on, Mr. Chair, deals with this. When we take this report to the councils, there is sufficient scope 
in reading and understanding that misunderstanding could happen very easily. We could end up with a great deal. There's, there's enough grist in this to satisfy a whole bunch of discussion. I had wondered whether the timing of taking it to the, to the municipalities might be done following the bringing together of an administrative group who are benefit from the, the in-depth discussions that have gone on here. And th those are members of staff. And that they would then act as a resource to municipalities on an informed basis. That's a thought that's gone through my head as, I'm si as I was sitting here. But so that we bring together the group, the steering group, from the municipalities to support CRD staff in wrestling with the next steps, the recommendations to us and that then goes out to the municipalities for endorsement. It's a question for me, and I think that the timing of that might be very awkward, because it's getting the information to members that worried me. I, uh, this is a very rich report. It's a very rich report. I, I, I think perhaps I will with, with, withdraw that thought, but, I, but it, it occurred anyway in, in thinking out loud that, that I wouldn't want it to go sideways because of the, of the richness of the subject matter in the, in the particular report. Staff, I would, uh, through the chair, I would like to hear what kind of timelines you have in mind. Mr. Chairman, just to, and to clarify the convening of the representatives, we, we effectively don't have the time to refer this out to each municipality and then convey that. So we would ask municipalities for, to provide a representative, bring that group together, and then ah. uh, fashion that that way. Uh, the municipalities, of course, will have access to this report. Yes. Uh, we're not, you know, the report is concluded and to be received, and it's out there. Out there, yes, okay. Uh, so uh, we would effectively immediately given we were not going up to the board with this notify municipalities in the next right. uh, number of days that we were looking for a representative as with provincial and federal agencies and first nations and try to convene that meeting All right. I, I can't give you a firm time there's a lot of logistics in pulling the group together so uh, i can just say that it'd be a priority to, to move that forward thank you bob director Durman. thanks mr chair i just wanted to reiterate what uh Bob just said, and uh, this is not going out to the municipalities at the time for referral, nor is this in the form that it would go to the board at this time. This is a report from a subcommittee or a citizens advisory committee uh, that was charged to do some information gathering and make some recommendations on that basis to this committee. Uh, now it's the job of this committee, but with staff, first of all, to work on putting that into a format that would be appropriate to go to the board level and then ultimately to, per, to municipalities after that process. Um, the reason why we need to involve municipalities and also need to involve the province, and as Director Brownoff has said, possibly a representative from the federal government, that this is indeed a multi-jurisdictional issue. And in order to staff to formulate that report, it will come back here, uh, all the jurisdictions have to be involved. So that's, uh, that's a normal process. It's not a process that normally would go to the board at this time, nor would it go to the municipalities, and so it's not intended that it do so. Thank you. Thank you, Director Dermott. Is, uh, is there anyone else? Can I call a question on this thing? Yes. Okay. Well, I think, uh, I think we've been, there's, there's clarity now as to what this motion means and what the expectation of the motion will be, so I'll call for the vote. Uh, those in favor? Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Now, just before you start patting yourselves on the back, I, um, I received yesterday um, a petition with over a thousand names on it that says uh, no to the deer cult. So we know that there is a lot of uh, passion that, is, that does exist in the community. And uh, again, I think this is more geographical uh, and uh, certainly something that uh, underscores the fact that there will be political decisions made by us in, in light of things like this. This, uh, this petition will, uh, will go into the information file we already have that's accessible to the directors. So, thank you. If there's nothing else, I'll take a motion to adjourn. Moved uh, by Director Hill, second by Director Blackwell. Those in favor, opposed carried. Once again, thank you to the committee. Thank you.